Hello, I'm Julian. So today I'm going to talk about from flat files to deconstructed database. So a little bit about me. I'm a principal engineer at WeWork. I'm one of the co-creators of Parquet. I've been involved with Apache projects for a while. I got my first commitership on the Apache Peak project. If you use Peak, yeah, so. Um, and I used Hadoop first at Yahoo in 2007. Uh, yeah, I'm old. Um, and formerly, I was at Twitter working on data platform. I worked at Dremio, and there was a presentation from Dremio today um, working on query engine stuff. Oh, also, I forgot. I'm also, this is a King Julian from Madagascar, who is, has the same first name as me. So if you don't, I'm Julian, like King Julian. Um, so here's the agenda, the, roughly how we go over that talk. So first, I'm going to talk about Hadoop. You know, at the beginning, there was Hadoop uh, created in 2005. But actually, you know, you know this guy? This is Michael Stonebreaker. I'm Turing Award winner, Michael Stonebreaker. So he's one of the legend of the database research, uh, famous for Ingress, Postgres, and more recently, Vertica and what we technically call not a bozo. And um, really, I really didn't like MapReduce at the beginning. And I'll go over why, why. And I'll finish with what the deconstructed database is. So this is a picture of a deconstructed bento box. And so you can see you have your Mackey, except you have all the ingredients separated. And you make whatever you want with it. So at the beginning, there was Hadoop. This is a picture of the original Hadoop toy that the Hadoop project is named after by Doc Cutting. So Hadoop is based on a couple of uh, Google papers, uh, the MapReduce paper and the GFS paper. And so those are the two main abstractions that you can build with. Uh, the f distributed file system, which is basically unlimited storage for whatever you want. And MapReduce, which is kind of the unlimited processes, or, you know, scales, you can throw more machines at it uh, for processing those files. And um, that's the basic idea behind Hadoop, and there's a lot you can do with this. Yeah, Hadoop is great for looking for a needle in a haystack with no plows. So it's kind of, especially at the time, it's kind of a blunt tool. Right, you're just like, oh, let's pour through all of this, throw a lot of machines at this, and um, and you know, and you can, and you can scale stuff, use a lot of horsepower, and you do it. But it's kind of blunt, especially at the beginning. So the main abstraction, right? I talked about the storage and the execution, and there are good thing about it, and there are bad things about it. You know, like storage is just flat files. You have files, any binary, any schema, no standard. And basically, the job must know how to split the data, how to make it like parallel processing. And execution is simple. Um, it's flexible. It's composable. Right? You can do multiple MapReduce jobs that do different things. And it's all based on we are going to run the mappers locally, close to the data. So you, know, you can very quickly load and process the data. Then there's the shuffle mechanism to reorganize the data around keys, right? You output key values, and you're going to put all the values for the same key on the same machine. And again, you can process them together and write locally. And the shuffle is usually the bottleneck part of the, of the process. But if you do your mappers right, your registers right, you can do a lot of processing. And it's, there are a lot of operations that map in this, or you can use a multiple MapReduce job to implement. And another aspect, yeah, so it ties execution with persistence, you know, it kind of all cobbled together. But if you want just to hack something, it's really good. So now we get back to Michael Stonebreaker, Turing Award winner, Michael Stonebreaker in 2015. And just like so, you know, MapReduce was becoming very, very popular. Everybody was talking about it. That was the best things in sliced bread. And so it's kind of like say like, hey guys, let's look a little bit about what we've been doing in database research for the past decades. 
uh, right? So the relational model was first described in 1969, um, and SQL was created in the 70s by IBM. Uh, in 86, it, the first uh, standard was described, and it's been updated, you know, you see all like from 89 to 2016, it's been updated many times. And over this, all that period of time, it's also became a standard, like everybody knows how understand SQL, can talk SQL, so like it's a base to a lot of tools. So if you're not using SQL, if you're not taking advantage of that, you're losing a lot. And there's also a bunch of good properties which Stonebreaker argued in his blog post at the time. Um, so first, when you write SQL, you define the logic of your application. You focus exclusively on what you want. And all the details about how it's stored, how it's indexed, how you optimize this process, all that is separated in a common implementation, right? So you can have all your logic, you have clean SQL queries that hopefully it's very clear what you're trying to achieve, and you don't mix together all the optimization, all the details on how you store the data, how you do a like, smart algorithm to make it go fast. All that is separated from your logic and reusable. Another aspect is integrity. In SQL, you put integrity constraints, right? You can define how your data is updated um, so that you don't get inconsistent data. Um, whether it's for referential integrity or generally your data respecting some constraints. And you have things like schemas and views to deal with evolution of the definition of your data. And of course, it's a standard, it's been around for a while, and you know, you benefit from the entire ecosystem. And so if we compare the abstraction, so remember in Hadoop you have file system and MapReduce, and in a relational database, um, the storage is abstracted under a notion of table, so a table as a schema, and uh, you focus more on the logical aspect of it, and it abstracts out how it's stored, the layout, indices, statistics. And the execution part is abstracted behind SQL, right? and again, you kind of decouple um, the whole logic of how the data is stored, and all the optimization on what's the best join to use, on what order to do the joins, or should we filter before we join, and all those kind of concerns, you decouple that from defining the logic of what you want. And if we dig a little deeper, right, so when the, you know, you have this picture, you have SQL, and then there are multiple steps on how it gets executed, and um, how you get to this efficient processing, right? You issue the SQL and the database returns the answer hopefully quickly. So the steps, first you start with parsing the SQL, the syntax, and then semantic is about making sense of, oh, this name is actually a table, it has a schema, so if, because this table has a schema, you can refer to the field that's part of that schema, so that's the semantic aspect. And then there's optimization step that's going to decide what order do we execute the joins in, uh, should we push the filters uh, first in the scan and all those things, and then you actually execute it. And so you, it all works well. It's a very well integrated system, right? The optimization rules really uh, are closely coupled with how uh, the execution is going to use them, right? So what's the best join? Uh, so you have this notion of cost-based optimization of like using this type of join include as this cost based on the size of the data, and this other type of join has a different cost, and we can combine a lot of different parameters together to try to find the best, most efficient, fastest plan for executing the query. So if you look at how it works, right, first you parse the syntax, you have your SQL query, you get like a tree, syntax tree that represents it. Next step is you get the schema, potentially statistics from your data, from your data. Uh, is there any index, is it sorted, a lot of information, and you feed that into the optimizer that will speed out the execution plan. And then once you have your plan, you run it on your database. So here, I'm kind of drawing a distributed type of database, like, you know, similar to Vertica or Redshift, all those, those MPP databases, which usually there's, your data is stored in a columnar format, you have pushdowns to make it efficient to um, 
project, retrieves the data from disk, and then you know, there's some kind of execution engine, and eventually the data gets to the user. And so you have this tight integration, and the optimizer knows exactly how the execution works to get the best plan for execution. And so that's well integrated, and that's how it's fast. So yeah, I mean, Michael Stonebreaker makes a point, right? So why did we go back to flat files and whatever craziness Hadoop is, is just like, like going with snowplows instead of that so elegant tool that we have with SQL? So there's some reason, right? SQL, there are a lot of constraints baked into SQL. And constraints are good because constraints are what allow for all those optimizations, right? Because we have this notion of table, um, and you know it has to look like it has a schema, and it's abstracted out, and SQL, and we fully understand what SQL is, right? So we have a SQL query when the optimizer knows exactly everything that's ha happening, unlike Hadoop, when you run code, it's kind of opaque, right? You have bytecode or um, whatever language you're using, and it's completely opaque to the framework, so it can't really optimize how you access data, whatever you do. So in SQL, you have a bunch of constraints how you access data, how you define your logic, and it's good because that's what enables the optimizer to do a lot of things and make it fast and um, all those things. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of use cases that don't fit that well in those abstractions. And so those constraints, it's important to have the right set of constraints. And in particular, databases don't have those, or it's not in that standard of having those lower level abstractions, right? It's kind of, especially at the time, like flat schemas, inflexible schema evolution, like everything in the table has to have the same schema. So when you're changing things, makes it harder. You always have to fix your old data to make it fit with a new schema. Um, you, there's a lack of lower level abstraction to access to the data in a less relational way. And those integrity constraints we talked about are not always very scalable when you start having like a distributed database. So there are a lot of constraints that didn't fit quite well. So constraints are good and what's enable very good implementation. But you, you know, as the world evolves, we need to evolve those constraints. And so that's the beauty of Hadoop. Like Hadoop is, there's no data shape constraints, so you can experiment, right? You can do graph data structure, nested data structure, and structure texts with semantic annotation. Like, like, and Hadoop came from the, you know, indexing the world for search engine. Um, Non-uniform schemas. You can do whatever you want. And it's just code, right? So there's room to scale a lot of different algorithms. You're not constrained by implementing it in SQL. You can implement it in different languages. You can do iterative stuff. You can do a lot of different things. Um, and so that's a lot more flexible. And a lot of machine learning logic works on top of Hadoop. And it's a lot harder to think about it in terms of SQL. Yeah, so there's. And there's the beauty of open source, right? So you can take Hadoop, you can fork it, you can take components, and all those things that exist in the Hadoop ecosystem, you can reuse them, you can reuse a component with something else, you can, there's a lot more room to innovate. If you look at you know, Oracle, you cannot take it apart and do things with it. Or even uh, Vertica, you cannot take it apart um, and do things. Like Postgres you do, and a lot of people have used Postgres or parts of Postgres to like Redshift is based on Postgres. Uh, a lot of things um, are. And so there's, this, there's a lot of things that can happen from that. Right, so Hadoop is flexible. It's so flexible and composable that you can actually implement SQL with this, right? And they did. So I'm sure a lot of you have used Hive. And when Hive started, right, like you kind of skip the optimizer part. And you just you parse the SQL, you produce a plan, and you kind of run it as a sequence of MapReduce jobs, right? So you can do your filter with a MapReduce, you join with a MapReduce job, you go by, and you throw, you know, it's composable snowplows. You throw snowplows after snowplows, and it's great. So that's the original Hive. I know that I see people who have been making Hive faster in the room. Uh, so that's the original Hive. It's not 
been working like that for a while. Um, open source in 2009, so that was just after um, Mike Stonebreaker's blog post. And so if we look 10 years later, uh, the, this all has changed a lot. Right, that's where we get to my deconstructed database image. Right, so you have all the ingredients, and you kind of recompose them in the way you want. And if you're a, an engineer, so this is a deconstructed uh, typewriter, and so you take a typewriter, you take it apart, and then you can recompose components. Right, so you kind of look at those database components, and you have the query model, the data exchange, uh, batch execution, storage layer, and you end up with a lot of different components. By the way, this is not an exhaustive picture. I just wrote and is focusing on open source components, really. But there are a lot of different things. And don't try to read it all. It's just like in your face. Like a lot of projects are collaborating in that space. And they all like kind of compose off of each other in some way. And so you can mix and match all those components. Um, there's storage. There's query model. Um, you have a lot of machine learning components that don't really fit in the traditional database uh, model. Data exchange, batch and streaming ex execution, you start seeing batch and streaming SQL uh, happening. And all those things, and they reuse similar components, and we can do different things. And as part of this like mess of all different components, all different competing projects, you can see some standard components emerging. And I'm going to talk about those a little bit. Some of the um, key things, there's columnar storage. And um, so obviously, Parquet is one of those. Uh, and Parquet being more like columnar addressed, like today, uh, most of those projects can read or write Parquet. Um, uh, SQL engine can read or write uh, Parquet. So it's that aspect, like if we look at Vertica, if we look at all those columnar MPP databases, that's like the lowest layer, right? How do you lay out the data so you can access it quickly? SQL parsing and optimization. So this optimizer step, um, one of the you know maybe less known and most used component of the Hadoop ecosystem is CalSite. And I, I'll have a, a slide to dig into that right after. Um, and CalSite is this optimizer that knows how to use a cost model to get the best plan. There's schema model. Like Avro is one of those uh, becoming the standard for defining schema in the big data world. Columnar exchange, Arrow, become the kind of interoperable, efficient format for exchanging data between all those systems. And I think in the table abstraction, I put like a more like a challenger, like Netflix iceberg is interesting in my opinion. It's more like a new thing, and it's kind of this is the area where we don't have a standard yet. Or, I mean, there's standards, but it's kind of, it's just been there from the beginning. But I think we need to improve in that area. So if you think about CalSite, what is CalSite? So if you look at, you know, I had this four step, how does SQL processing happen from syntax, semantic, optimization, execution? So CalSite is all the first part. He takes SQL in, so CalSite as the parser, you know, it's like your front end. He knows how to parse SQL, represent it as a model, and then you can provide plugins on how you're going to expose your schemas. And I'm simplifying a bit because there's a lot of things you can plug into CalSite. So on purpose, I'm making like a simpler use case. When you have plugins for schemas, and you can plug in optimizer rules that depend on your execution engine, and you provide that to CalSite, and it has all the dynamic programming logic uh, of a cost-based optimizer to provide to you the best plan. Right, so how you manipulate this data, how you normalize it, and how you provide the best plan, and then you can provide your own execution engine. And CalSign has its own um, little execution built in, but um, usually I'm thinking in terms of distributed execution. And uh, Julian Hyde right here is in the room, so if you have questions, ask him instead. 
uh, because you know a lot more than I do. So you can imagine you have all those storage things and you can have little plugins and you can have optimizer rules that are either specific to the storage layer or specific to the execution layer. And you know that's, that powers a lot of different projects. So to give you an idea, and I'm sure this is not exhaustive, but today CalSight is used as the optimizer in Hive, in Apache Drill, in Phoenix, Phoenix being SQL on top of HBase, in Kylin, which is a cube engine, and there's also a bunch of streaming SQL engine, which is like more real-time uh, dashboard producing using SQL, like Apache Apex, Flink, um, and there's a Samza SQL and Storm SQL um, that use CalSight. So it's just like it's used everywhere. It is really one of those. Um, standard components. If you think of the storage layer, so there are two key components. Um, you know, there's like the immutable aspect, which is more like for analysis. You store data over time, and then the mutable storage layers, and they all will have like some important characteristics they share to make efficient query processing on top of them. So I'm going to summarize it looking at the push downs, right? So that's what we refer to as push downs. And that this common interface layer for storage from analytics perspective, right? How do we access this data efficiently? So in the query, you will have a filter, you will access only a subset of the columns, uh, and possibly you do aggregations. So a lot of those things you want to do as close to the storage layer as you can. And so that's where columnar representation, the columnar layout helps with projection. So projection is accessing only the columns you want. Predicate pushdowns is about using, at the same time, the layout. Maybe the data is partitioned. Maybe the data is, is sorted. And then you can use that to scan only the parts that match your filters. Or maybe the data has statistics. And so same thing, you can skip part of it based on the filter and be much more efficient at accessing the data you want. And aggregation, similarly, once you access only the columns you want, only the rows you want, and you're performing aggregation to avoid materializing this intermediary data and sending it to the query engine, you can start aggregating just in right there. As you're reading the data, you can start summing, for example, and add all those values, and you return just this, instead of returning the entire data you scan and summing it up later. So all those, those are like the key three things you want in a storage layer to make it really efficient at querying. And a lot of those um, support that. And you, you see like having that, that's part of that key storage component. Whether it's mutable or immutable, um, having those properties is very interesting. So if we look at the bigger picture of how things interact, Right, so this is an example of how a query execution works. So on the previous slide, I was focusing on the optimi optimizer, and that's the execution. How we do, do we do distributed execution of a query? So if we take a simple query that's doing an aggregation with a sum, you see on the right, you know, you pass it to CalSight, CalSight produce the plan, and we imagine that we have three nodes on that cluster, in the scanner, we CalSight will have pushdowns, the filters, the projection as low as possible so that we read as little data from disk as possible. And arrow is this in-memory columnar representation that combines three properties. The first is to be an efficient format for query processing in memory. Right? It's columnar, so you can do very efficient vectorized execution. Second, it's uh, the way it's laid out make it serialization free. So there's no overhead in copying it from memory to the network back to memory because the representation in memory is exactly the same than on the wire, um, unlike things like Avro or other, you know, like uh, anything that builds objects in memory, you would end up doing a lot of lookups, a lot of small um, allocations in memory, uh, and a lot of like writing pla in random places in memory that make it really inefficient for serialization, deserialization, um, or for memory access from a query engine perspective. And that's look all looking at this from the query engine perspective. So columnar representation, 
that can be serialized, sent to the network without any serialization cost is very efficient. And the third property is it being standard, right? So that you can exchange data without having to worry about using the lowest common denominator between system, whether it's like pickle or JSON or CSV, or all those things that are very not efficient. And so that's where Arrow fits in being really good as the in-memory representation for execution and as an exchange format. So just a quick stop on the stream persistence layer. And so like everybody knows about Kafka, Pulsar is another interesting project that Kafka has a lot more adoption than Pulsar, but I think Pulsar has a lot of interesting characteristics. So I invite you to go take a look. And there, you know, if you think of that projection push down notion, a lot of those things for um, at rest storage for batch analytic or for stream persistence when you do real time analytics, you need all the same characteristics in the storage layer. So having the ability to pushing down your filters, accessing only the fields you need and possibly aggregation to the streaming layer is going to make it a lot more efficient because we spend a lot of time just sending data over the wire because we have the storage system decoupled from the execution system. And so it's really important to optimize how much data we send on the network. And so a lot of you know, properties that this system have that make a lot of sense, uh, making sure to keep track of the, cons the state of the consumer so that we know how to recover from failure, there's this notion of snapshot that they are point in times. We're not consistent all the time, but there are points in time where we are consistent. Uh, decoupling the performance of reads and writes so that you know writes don't impact reads or reads don't impact writes. Having the ability to do parallel reads, replication, data isolation, are all good properties of those system. And I put two there, but that's kind of what makes it a reusable component in that stack of all um, it's really important to have those good common feature and interfaces so that we can mix and match those components, right? They are common features that make sense in that big picture. So if you look at the blueprint, how all those things fit together, what does our big data infrastructure look like today with all those components? So I started with the simple pictures, right? So today we build our apps in the cloud. So people use apps that are hosted in the cloud and we send events like drop, raindrops falling from those clouds, tracking what people are doing, how the apps are, are behaving, and those droplets make streams, and you have streams of data coming, and they feed into data lakes. And uh, so that's my picture, so that you know, the next, next diagram is less dry. And, um, and so you see those are little uh, water mills, like processing this data downstream. So we look at the more like architecture-like diagram, right? So you still have apps, whatever, sending data to a, a stream persistent layer. And, you know, usually that would go, a very common way of doing this is using Avro to have a schema for those things, right? And then they kind of, they get, they can get processed in that stream, um, Layer, is it the pointer? Here we go. Right, so the data comes here. And usually, you know, I would say like Avro is a good contender to have a schema on that data. And you can have stream processing that consume it and produce some derived data sets. And then eventually you archive it in a more long term storage and it's going to be converted to a more analytics friendly format like Parquet. And then you can have a lot of batch processing also creating derived data sets um, and producing either, you could have periodic dashboards, you can have interactive analysis where people are more exploring the data. Same thing, you can have real time dashboards, but you can, in both streaming and batch world, you can produce data driven product, right? So you can build recommendations you can build uh, abuse detection models. You can do machine learning and use that to feed back into the product and make data-driven products. So two main use cases are you know, dashboards, understanding 
how people are using the product, what works, what doesn't work, um, and also feeding back into the product and have asynchronous data-driven products. So that's kind of the user aspect, like what analysts are using. And on the other side, you noticed every time there's data persistent, I put like data APIs in front. Right, that's where we need to pay attention to just not use the raw storage, but have some kind of abstraction that defines a schema. And understand that every data has a schema, understand the lineage, how we produce derived data sets, um, what version of what data sets depend on what version of some other data set, and how to make sense of all of this. Because as your company grows and you have all your teams consuming and producing data in that environment, it very quickly becomes chaos. So helping people to understand how they depend on each other, you know, that's where you have like monitoring, my thing is broken because it depends on something else, and what's happening in this, right? So kind of having a schema registry, like data abstraction, metadata, capturing the dependencies, what the data sets, what format they're in, who produces them, who consumes them, and understanding these on overall global lineage graph. So that's kind of like the general blueprint, at like 3,000 feet up. And if we look at the future, you know, we talked about this disconstructed database, but we're not there yet. There's some missing components. And I think as a community, I know we're working on some of those. I know a lot of people are working on some of those and we need to improve. You know, we have this great open source, composable world of a lot of components, uh, but there are a few things we need to improve, right? So still improving the better data abstraction. You know, it's kind of metadata repository, understanding what table exists, what schema they have, you know, is there statistics for optimization, understanding how they're produced, right? Dependencies, between jobs that are consuming, producing data, how the whole thing um, is being created. Um, there's some, like mentioned Netflix Iceberg there, that's pretty good at producing data abstraction uh, for file-based data sets. And understanding these common pushdowns, right? So this whole notion of data abstraction and having the good properties that make it efficient, you can, one, make sense of it in your entire, you know, if you think your big data infrastructure as being a giant database. And second, um, kind of make it more efficient. Better interoperability, so that's some of the work we've done with Apache Arrow in making sure things interoperate, have a good standard format that is efficient for query execution, a lot of different data processing, and at the same time is standard. So getting to that consensus to have this glue that can put all those projects together. And so it's ongoing, you know, it's uh, adopted in Spark. There's Python Spark integration is already much better by using Arrow. Uh, it's used in Apache Drill. It's used in many different places. The um, uh, GPU-based processing community is using it a lot. And so that's really neat. And the other thing we need to get better at is better data governance understanding where our user data is, being able to modify it, know how we're using it. You know, people store the hand in there saying GDPR, how can we do it? It's all common sense. We really should be doing it. We should really should be knowing what we do with our user data and where it is and if they like it and if we should delete it. So some prediction, I think it would make a lot of sense to have a common access layer to all that data, whether it's immutable or mutable and have this common access layer that implements you know, schema evolution, uh, consistent good implementation of pushdowns, access control, anonymization, and you know, that's kind of this lower layer of the database because you have Parquet, but Parquet is a file format and so it's really low level. So I have a layer just on top of that that abstract out the stable notion. Right? And the second is kind of like thinking of this multi-tier um, Stream, you know, we always have stream to batch um, and converting the data for row to columnar. And this really should be one integrated stack where we know how to do the pushdowns, whether for stream or for batch. And we know how to abstract out this whole conversion from row oriented to batch oriented. So on that, I'm going to say thank you.